Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida IFAS Extension Service in Hernando County, Florida. And today we're going to be talking about eating in the heat, alternative grown edible plants for Florida summers. And that's quite a mouthful. So this is a really, really important topic. This is something that we see a lot of people kind of get confused about trying to grow the wrong things at the wrong time of year. And this is focusing really on the kind of things that you would want to put in your vegetable garden. Beginning now, really, from the beginning of June or June 15th or so, it's really the beginning of summer here in Central Florida. And you're not going to be able to successfully grow things that maybe you were able to grow up north during the summer. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to give you some ideas of things that you can grow successfully here in the heat. And maybe for a lot of you, these are going to be things that you've never tried before, you've never heard of before. So hopefully everybody's going to learn something here and we're going to send you away with some ideas of things to experiment with this summer. So some problems with Florida summers is it gets really hot and really humid all day and all night also. So maybe you've moved here from somewhere up north or a different state and you're thinking, well, where I moved from, it gets hot in the summer and it rains and it's humid. So what's the difference? The difference is here in central Florida, the heat and humidity goes 24 hours a day. So overnight, it's not really gonna drop below 70 degrees. We get late in the day rains. So everything sits wet outside all night and it's warm and it's 100% humidity. That is absolutely perfect for um, disease formation in your garden. So a lot of the different things that maybe you're used to growing during the summer up north are just gonna to succumb to diseases down here. And also during the summer, or once we start to get into the heat, humidity, you're going to see an increase in diseases and also insects. So all the different insect pests that are going to uh, feed on your traditional vegetable garden are going to be out in full force. And even though you might be a member of a Facebook gardening group and you'll see people on there saying, well, I grow tomatoes all year long, my peppers and this and that do just fine all summer long they are definitely the exception to the rule. And it becomes a lot of work. You're out there spraying an awful lot with insecticides and fungicides. And for a lot of traditional vegetable crops, it's just really not worth the time and trouble during the summer. As a general rule, all of them are gonna grow either in the fall or the spring or over the winter, just great. It's just for a few months during the summer, they're not the best choice. So what kind of things do not grow well here during the summer, which is generally from June 1st or June 15th or so until August or September when the days start to get shorter and the heat starts to break a tiny bit. Most of those European vegetables are just not going to do well here from June through August. So think the things that you grew up north during the summer, the tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, green beans. Uh, all the other vegetables, the winter squash, summer squash, zucchini, they're going to have huge disease problems and insect problems down here. So if you think about, well, what can I grow? There are options. You're going to look at kind of traditional Southern cuisine, and we're going to cover them in just a moment. And you're also going to think more about South and Central American and African vegetables and many Asian vegetables because parts of Asia are very tropical and steamy also, you're gonna think about what grows in other parts of the world where the environment in the summer is similar to here in Central Florida during the summer. So you're gonna be thinking more tropical crops than temperate crops or European type vegetable crops. So traditional Southern summer crops, things like okra, sweet potatoes, Southern peas, and with this picture here, you can ignore most of the peas on here, except the ones at the very bottom in the left-hand corner, black eye peas, they are a type of Southern pea. And they are different from green beans and other peas in that it's more of a tropical bean crop. 
So they're going to grow just fine here during the summers. So uh, when you when you think, you know, Cajun cooking, Southern cooking, uh, looking up recipes from Southern cooking books, this and that, they're going to include okra, sweet potatoes, Southern peas. That's because they grow very well in the South, in the heat during the summer. Really, all of them can be grown up north also, but they're more difficult up north because they have a shorter hot summer time than what we have here. Here, we have from June till, gosh, September or October to grow these things, so they grow just great here. So let's go through each one, one at a time. Okra, not everybody's favorite. I like okra very much. It's really important for any kind of Cajun cuisine. You have to have okra for a good gumbo. Uh, with any of these different crops, if you look online, there are a huge number of different recipes and things you can try. Give it a try. Try a recipe with okra. And if you don't like it, you don't have to eat it again, but you should at least try it once. Okra does very well here because it's native to West Africa. It is a tropical vegetable. It loves the summer heat. So when it gets really hot and steamy, okra just grows even better. As a matter of fact, okra is very easy to grow down here in Florida. If you ever try growing it farther up north, like way up in the northeast or the northern Midwest, it's difficult because the summers are shorter up there. It's not hot enough for it really to do well up there. One problem or one issue with okra that I need to point out is it is very susceptible to root knot nematodes. Nematodes are microscopic roundworms that live in the soil, and some species are going to attack their plants, certain plants, and damage the roots. And then the plant can't take up water, can't take up nutrients. It's going to start to wilt a lot and eventually die. Root knot nematodes love okra. So if you're not sure if you have root knot nematodes in your garden or not, you can try growing some okra. If it does really well, that's great. You don't have nematodes in your garden. If your okra starts to wilt and, you know, die back and not look that good, try digging up a couple of the plants and look at the roots. Because what happens to okra is the root knot nematodes will eat all the roots. So you'll dig up the okra plant. And if you see absolutely no roots, you have a lot of root knot nematodes. They're difficult to get rid of and control. Basically, if you have root knot nematodes, okra is probably not the best choice for you to grow in your garden in the ground. Now you can grow it in containers just fine, but in the soil, it's really difficult to rid your garden of root knot nematodes. There's certain things that you could do to help reduce their numbers, but because they have such such a taste for uh, okra, they're going to damage your okra if you try growing it. But if you're able to plant and grow okra, you want to pick it when the okra, the, the pods are small and tender, and you need to pick it frequently. Because if you let the okra get too large, it gets hard as a twig off of a tree and becomes very, very fibrous and not very good. So you want to pick your okra young and early. Baby okra is best. And okra is a member of the mallow family, uh, Malvaceae, I believe. And so it's related to hibiscus and cotton. So if you grow okra, one of flowers, if you look at it, it's like, that looks just like a hibiscus flower. You're correct because they're in the same family. The flowers look very, very similar. But during the summer here, very, very easy to grow. Probably don't want to try it in the winter because it just gets too chilly here in the winter. You can grow okra in South Florida during the winter, but it's not going to do well outside of South Florida. Sweet potatoes are native to the Americas, and this is a crop that not many people think of growing. I've grown sweet potatoes before, and oh my gosh, they are very, very low maintenance, very easy to grow. Plant them, let them go all summer long. They usually get by just fine with the rains that we get. And in the fall, when you start digging them up, you're going to have sweet potatoes. If you plant a lot, you could potentially get bushels of sweet potatoes. They're going to range anywhere from little sweet potatoes to really like, gosh, almost the better part of a football size sweet potato. I think that's about the biggest that I've grown. They do require a long season. It takes about 100 days. 
for when you plant the shoots into your garden bed and you're going to harvest them, but they're very low maintenance. You really don't need to do much to them. You can start your own oak, you can start your own sweet potato shoots or sweet potato plants from sweet potatoes that you buy at the grocery store. So you can go to the grocery store, pick up a couple of um, sweet potatoes, look for fairly small ones, and plant them in a pot, bury them maybe three quarters deep in the soil, and wait a little bit, and they're gonna send up little shoots. When the shoots get about four inches long, clip them back all the way back to the, where they're coming out of the sweet potato and put them in a separate container of soil and they root very easily and very quickly. After they're rooted, you can transplant them into your garden. So you can buy sweet potato um, slips online through different um, online gardening seed stores and vegetable stores. And there's a number of different specific varieties of sweet potatoes you can grow. But I've always just used the grocery store ones and been very, very happy with them. They can, like I said, potentially give you a very, very large harvest of sweet potatoes. And apparently the leaves are very edible and apparently very tasty. I've honestly never tried them, but I've known of a number of other people that go out there and pick the leaves off the sweet potatoes, throw them in salad, eat them raw, slightly steamed, stir fried, whatever. And they're very nutritious and very good too. So you can grow sweet potatoes, eat the leaves, and then let them go for at least 100 days. Gently dig around the base of the plants. And you're going to use your hands for this. Don't use a shovel because then you're just chopping up your sweet potato roots. You don't want to do that. But feel around the soil. And you're going to kind of dig around until you feel a sweet potato, grab it, pull it up. And that's how you harvest it. Very easy. Southern peas. Southern peas are originally from India and Africa. They were grown by uh, the ancient Greeks and Romans also. So southern peas, if you're not familiar, familiar with that term, that includes crowder peas, cream peas, and also black-eyed peas. Black-eyed peas are probably the, the best known by most people out of these. They grow really well during the summer because they're a slightly different species from your traditional regular peas and green beans, they are technically a tropical vegetable. They're gonna grow just great during the summer. I grew black eyed peas once before, and you plant the seeds now, let them grow over the summer. They're gonna flower. They're gonna get the pods that look just like green beans. You're gonna let the pods grow and fill out. When they get large enough, you can pick them and bring them inside and let them dry, or let them stay on the plant until the pods turn brown and they're dried out. At that point, pick them and let them get good and dry. Then you have to sit there and break the pods open and dump the peas out. And there you go. You have your own dry black eyed peas, just like you would pick up in a bag at a grocery store. I grew them once before. They turned out really well. They, were, they tasted great. Uh, very productive. One little word of warning. For some reason, aphids love southern peas. So if you're growing them, keep an eye out for aphids. Mine got aphids, and I have never seen so many aphids in my life. The plants were covered, and I had a really tough time getting them under control. So keep an eye out for aphids and other insect pests. Other than that, black-eyed peas, and you know, black-eyed peas are, you know, a good old-fashioned southern staple also. So there are a lot of tropical options out there. Some of these maybe you're familiar with and you've eaten and enjoyed before. Maybe other ones are totally new to you. But there are a number of different root crops that you can try growing during the heat of summer. And these are all native to different parts of South and Central America. Yucca or cassava, you can buy at a grocery store. They sell it at Wayne Dixie. They have it at Walmart. They have it at Publix. Uh, it's a great big root. It's uh, traditionally been used and grown. Very, very good source of starches and for people on a, a kind of basic diet, very nutritious. Boniato, and there's a number of other types of sweet potatoes. The picture here is boniato and it's white flesh. So think funny looking sweet potato when you cut it open, it's white inside. There are purple varieties also that you can grow. and all of these 
you can either purchase online from just just go ahead and google it there's companies that sell uh starts or slips or small roots online that you can plant in your garden or for most of them if you go to the grocery store or even better if you have a uh, hispanic grocery store near you go in there look in their produce department many of these if you take a root home and try planting it it is going to send up shoots and if, like i said with sweet potatoes you trim those shoots off where they connect to the root and put them in a container of soil they're going to root very easily transplant them in your garden and these are just going to grow vines they're going to grow leaves they're going to grow and spread and take over a fairly large area in the garden but you just leave them alone the regular rainfalls that we get here during summer are going to be fine for growing boniato yucca all the different south and central american root crops and then in the fall, when they start to die back a little bit, dig around in the soil, feel around, and hopefully you have a lot more roots there than what you started with. You can go ahead and start them right now. We are, I think, as of today or yesterday, starting into official summer. We're starting to get those late in the day rains. It's pretty warm and pretty sunny outside today. It's going to be like this for the next couple months. And if you're a little confused about exactly what to do with yucca, boniato, any of these other things, just look online. There are a huge number of different Cuban and Central American recipes that you can experiment with. I have had uh, Cuban uh, yucca before. I did an internship at University of Florida and worked with a young lady who had moved here from Cuba. And she made some and brought it in one day. I love yucca. I thought it was excellent. You have to throw in a lot of pepper and garlic and other spices and everything. You can take the yucca. It ends up looking, you can cut it into chunks or you can mash it like sweet potatoes and you make it into little patties and fry it. There's a lot of different ways that you can prepare it. It's If you haven't tried it before, I'd highly recommend at least giving it a try. It might be something that you really like and is going to kind of spice up your family's diet and what you're able to make for dinner. Squashes, there are some squashes that grow well here during the heat of summer, but they're ones that you're probably not really familiar with. Traditional yellow squash and crookneck squash and most zucchinis and even the winter squash like butternut and acorn, they are a certain species that do not do well in extreme heat and humidity. They're very, very disease. They're like little disease magnets. But there's a slightly different species of uh, winter squash, Cucurbita moschata. And there's a couple different varieties of that. And they are tropical. And they do just fine in the heat and humidity. This picture here is one of our regular followers, followers Renee DeRosa, who tried growing. This is a calabasa that she has in her hand. And this thing is huge. I think it weighed in at like over 40 pounds. And she grew this a few years ago and sent me pictures. And she was kind enough to drop one of them off at the office. Not this one. It was a much smaller one. And I cut it up. And I've had calabasa or Cuban pumpkin before. Very good. A lot of really great recipes online for roasting it. And I cooked it up. I saved the seeds. The next summer, I planted the seeds. And here, let me go ahead and skip ahead. I grew them in my backyard. And there's one of the ones that I picked also. I only got four squash off the vines. But each one was 20 pounds. So I got 80 pounds of winter squash over the summer when very little else is going to grow. And you can see down by my knees there the vines, and a lot of them are chewed up by caterpillars. I did have to spray for caterpillars two, three times. They got a, lot, a little bit of caterpillar damage. Other than that, very, very carefree, easy to take care of, very productive. And when you're getting squash that big, you don't have to get an awful lot of them to get a pretty good harvest off of them. So these type of squashes include calabasa, which is also known as Cuban pumpkin, Seminole pumpkin, which is very, very closely related. They just are shaped a little bit different, slightly different coloration. They tend to be more round. This includes loofah also. If you're familiar with loofah that you can um, make sponges out of, bath sponges, that is a squash. You can grow them during the summer. If you pick them when they're very small, they're edible. 
when you let them get to full size, it's a large, hard uh, winter squash. You have to break off the outside shell and the inside is sponge-like. And you can use it as sponges in your bathtub when you're taking a bath. Or like I said, if you want, you can pick them when they're very small and eat them. They're edible and safe to eat also. So there's a couple of other um, options here. There are now some varieties of pumpkins. And this is one that was uh, developed and released by University of Georgia, just to our north. And its name is Orange Bulldog Pumpkin. So if you look that up online, they have a lot of information on that. This is a variety of pumpkin that they found in the jungles somewhere in South or Central America. They brought it back. They tried crossbreeding it. So no GMOs involved, just good old fashioned growing them out, cross-pollinating, breeding them. And they have a variety of pumpkin that grows really, really well during the summer. I just planted some in my backyard garden about a week or so ago. They just came up. So in a few months, I'll be able to share with you how well they did. I'm hoping to get pumpkins out. Now, if you want to grow pumpkins for a beautiful jack-o'-lantern that you carve up for um, Halloween, this is probably not your best option because they don't grow generally really beautiful, large, round pumpkins. But, you know, pumpkin is very edible. Pumpkin is a winter squash. And you can grow it. You can, you know, peel off the hard outside skin, take the inside flesh, cook it, have it with dinner. I do that every fall when the pie pumpkins come to the grocery stores. You can uh, cook it and puree it. Dogs love pumpkin puree, and it's very good for them also. You could try adding the spices and seasonings and everything else to and make your own pumpkin pie. So pumpkins are good for a lot more than a jack-o'-lantern or a pumpkin pie. They're very, very high in vitamin A, vitamin C, so very good for you. And there are certain specific varieties of pumpkins that are going to do well during the heat of summer. Now, not every variety of pumpkin does well during the summer. The other ones you're going to have to try growing very early in the spring, possibly in the fall. They're difficult in the fall because they have a lot of disease problems. But this variety is one that I'm hoping is going to be very low maintenance. I'm just going to be able to let it grow and take over half of my backyard for the next few months. And then hopefully in a few months, I'm going to be able to go out there and pick a couple of pumpkins off of it. So we'll see. I'll let you know how well it works out. Chiote squash is another one that maybe a lot of you aren't familiar with. That's this kind of green, bumpy looking fruit here. Chiote squash is native to Guatemala and it's a good summer squash substitute. If you take that and peel it and cook the inside, it's very, very similar to yellow squash. I've seen this growing in Costa Rica when I visited down there. They grow it commercially on a small scale in. Miami. I saw a farmer's field of this right alongside of the highway between Miami and Homestead. It is a vine. You have to grow it on a sturdy trellis because they get very large and the fruits get very heavy. But this is really unusual because the way that if you want to try growing this, the way you do that is you go to the grocery store and you buy a chiote squash. Most grocery stores carry it most of the time. Not every store, but I've seen them. If you go to a Hispanic grocery store, I can almost guarantee they're going to have it. You buy the squash, take it home, plant it three quarters of the way deep in the soil, and let it be. It will germ. It has seeds in the center, and the seeds will germinate and grow out through the squash, send up a number of shoots. It's going to grow up your trellis, and it's going to grow all summer long. Hopefully, it's going to flower and fruit, and you're going to get some squash off of it the first year. It's perennial. So if you leave it alone, in the winter, it's going to totally die back. You can clip it back to the ground, throw away the dead vines, you're good. Next spring, the plants are going to come back on their own. Apparently, you're going to get the best harvest off of it and the heaviest harvest in year two or three off of the vines. So this is something a little bit different, but they love the heat, they love the humidity, they love the rainfall. And they're going to do great during the summer. 
And even though they might have a few little disease problems, it's not going to be a huge issue. You're probably not even going to have to spray with fungicides or do a whole lot to it. So tropical spinaches, I know on a lot of different Facebook groups, people love the idea of these. And these are plants that are not true spinach. So if you go to the grocery store, you buy a bag of spinach, it's Spinaceae oleraceae. That is the botanical name for traditional spinach. There are different varieties. Some of it is crinkly, some of it's more flat leaf. Some varieties get bigger leaves, some a little bit smaller but it's all true spinach. These are just different species of plants that have edible leaves. And I don't think I've ever really tried any of it before. People say it tastes like spinach and you can use it as a spinach substitute, but it's probably not really everybody's favorite. So this is gonna include plants like Malabar spinach, Okinawa spinach, longevity spinach, so they're all not true spinach, it's just spinach light. I know a couple of years ago at our Master Gardener Nursery, we carried Malabar spinach, I believe, over the summer. And this is a picture of Malabar spinach growing in a pot. Stuff grows like a weed. So that plant is gonna grow like crazy. It's gonna get six feet tall, lots of leaves. I was told that if you pick the leaves and eat them raw, it's pretty tasty. Does taste kind of like spinach. But if you try cooking it, it gets slimy. So for something like this, we definitely recommend experimenting with it and trying it. But you probably don't want to plant a 100-foot row right off the bat until you're sure that you like it and you and your family are going to actually eat it. So heck, look online and try growing all three different kinds. See which one you like the best, if any. If there's one you really like, Next summer, plant a whole lot more because these do great during the heat of summer. They will die back in the fall. It's not a good choice for growing during the winter. They're going to struggle because especially when the days get shorter and the temperatures finally start to cool off. But during the summer, something you could try growing. So University of Florida has these great infographics. There's one for every month. And if you follow us on Facebook, Teresa is diligent about posting these the first of the month, uh, along with infographics on um, flowering trees that are going to be in bloom that month, uh, beekeeper uh, highlights and things that if you keep for beekeepers, you know, that you need to keep in mind per month. But if you look at what UF recommends for growing in June, in Central Florida, it's the kind of things that we went over, boniato, Gingers, edible gingers and turmeric grow just great during the summer. They die back in the winter, so they only grow during the summer. Uh, sugar cane, you could try growing that for fun. That's going to grow every summer. Tropical spinaches, cassava, calabasa, lufa, all these sweet potatoes, all these different things. You don't see tomatoes, cucumbers, green peppers, things like that on there, because this is just not the time of year to grow them. Up north it is, but here, even if you are able to be successful with them, it's going to take a lot of work, a lot of insecticides, a lot of fungicides. You're going to have to be out there every day checking up for insects, because if you skip a week or so, insects will pop up and they're going to have a field day out there. It doesn't take caterpillars and leaf-footed bugs and squash bugs long to do a lot of damage on those other crops out there. So because it gets so difficult, usually best to just save those crops for spring, for fall, other things you can grow just great during the winter, but it's best during the summer to grow things that are gonna be as low maintenance as possible. Here's July and you see it's pretty much the same thing. Um, Southern peas down at the bottom, okra, uh, chayote squash, pumpkin. Like I said, certain varieties of pumpkin and squash do really well. A lot of other varieties are growable. They're just really, really tough to grow. So if I covered a lot of things and you're thinking like, I've never heard of those before. Or, I've heard of them, but I've never tried them. I don't know if I'm going to like them or not. 
I don't know if you're gonna like it or not either. So uh, you're gonna have to just kind of give them a try. It's really smart that before you go planting, a, plant your entire backyard garden in something that you've never tried before, give it a try. We do, I know here, right here in Spring Hill, and you don't have to go very far to find Asian supermarkets, Hispanic grocery stores, pop in, give them a visit, look around. Chances are you're going to see things that you've never seen before. It's like, mm, wow, that looks pretty interesting. Maybe I'll have to give it a try. Pick up some boniato, pick up some yuca, go home, Google it, find a recipe that sounds pretty good, give it a try. What's going to happen is either you're going to love it and that's great. And now you know that you can plant it during the summer and you can actually grow it in your own backyard. Or you're going to hate it and you know that you're not going to go out and plant that one because either you or your family, nobody else is going to eat it. So the only way that you're going to learn is by buying some and giving it a try and try it first before you plant a hundred foot long row of it. So we want everybody to stay informed this summer. There's all of our contact information. If you ever have a gardening question, just shoot me an email. That's the best way to get in touch with me. Everybody needs to, when we're all done with this, go ahead and go to Hernando Extension, all one word, dot com, and bookmark that because that's a freestanding webpage. And whenever we schedule a class, either myself or Lily or anybody else in our office, it pops up on there and gives you all the details, whether it's in person, on Zoom, if you have to register or not, the day, the time, everything you need to know to get involved and stay informed is going to be right there for you. So go ahead and bookmark that. That's the easiest and simplest way to find out what we're up to and what we have coming up. Now, I wanted to point out that we record all these classes and now we go ahead and send them off to Hernando County government and John, our good friend, John Cancel, who is their uh, videographer, does a wonderful job of cleaning up the videos. He tries to go through and take out as many ums as he can and puts in the intro, the outro, a little bit of music and puts them on Hernando County government's YouTube channel. So go to YouTube, the little search box up at the very top, type in Hernando County government, and you're gonna to go to their YouTube channel and my classes are up there. Lily's classes are up there. We do have past classes on growing sweet potatoes with an uh, extension expert who works with commercial growers over on the eastern side of the state who grow sweet potatoes over there commercially. And a really great class on growing calabasa with Dr. Maru. He is a University of Florida plant breeder who is working with Calabasa growers down in South Florida because there is a huge market for it and commercial growers can and do grow it. He's working on different uh, kind of um, specializing in different specific varieties that are going to do well and growers can pick from and hopefully soon we'll have named varieties of Calabasa because right now it's just a mix. If you get calabasa seeds from somebody, they may get really, really big, like the one picture I showed you. They may be small, different shapes, slightly different tastes, slightly different growth habits. Some grow better and produce more, some less. So he's doing a lot of work on that. That was a really great class, and it will tell you everything you need to know to grow calabasa. But like I said from that picture I showed you, it really was as simple as planting the seeds and letting it grow. I sprayed twice for caterpillars when I had an outbreak. Other than that, I lost a few to some kind of animal or, or insect that ate squash when they were really, really small. I only got four, but I got 80 pounds of calabasa off of those plants. So you can't get a whole lot easier than that. So let me go ahead and get out of screen sharing there. And let me get into the chat and answer a couple of questions. And Bobby says that she tried fried okra at Dickie's 
I love fried okra. You don't want to eat too much fried food. It's not the healthiest for you. But frying okra is a very, very good way to prepare it. Uh, Susan asked, do we cut the whole potato in the soil or put the whole potato in the soil or cut it? With sweet potatoes, I buy fairly small ones. I plant the whole potato in a container of soil. You don't have to plant it all the way in. If you plant it three quarters deep, it's gonna start sending out shoots. Now you could plant a whole potato directly in your garden. It will grow. And hopefully by fall, you're gonna have more potatoes than that. But I'm cheap. I only buy a couple potatoes and they're my starter or seed potatoes. And then as it makes more shoots, and they will, they'll keep sending out more and more shoots. I take each shoot, try potting each one up individually, it will root and send out roots very quickly. And then that goes in my garden. This summer, I'm, I have a large area kind of dedicated to sweet potatoes. So I'm going to be starting a lot of them and hopefully getting a really good harvest this fall. And Risa says both methods work. And Bobby loves that monthly chart. You know, out of everything that we post on Facebook, that gets the most likes and the most traffic. People love that. And it's very, very helpful also. Helps new residents to kind of keep them on track. If you follow that, and for obviously for here in Central Florida, or in Fernando County, you want to follow the column for Central Florida. For anybody watching this in North Florida, or South Florida, the rules are kind of the same, but the timing is a little bit different. So if you just follow your column also, that is going to keep you on track. Susan asks, how about peanuts? Good suggestion. Yes, peanuts do grow here in the heat of summer. You can plant peanuts right now. I never tried growing them, but they grow a ton of them just north of us. Drive through uh, rural Levy County, and you're going to see nothing but acres and acres and acres of peanuts up there. They grow a ton of them. So peanuts are going to grow very well during the heat of summer. And Risa says that she's had great luck with sisu spinach as well. That's another type, another species of plant with edible leaves that's spinach-like. Uh, for her, it's the best texture and taste for tropical spinach. Like I said, a lot that's going to be kind of personal, um, personal taste about whether you like it or not. Growing conditions say full sun, but mine does far better in dappled sun. I have it growing under a tree right now, so that helps. A lot of these different things, if you can give them a little bit of shade, especially in the afternoon, that's going to be good. But for most of them, I'm thinking my sweet potatoes are full sun. Uh, calabasa, the other tropical squashes, they were outgrowing in full sun. Didn't really bother them. Sun, the rain, the humidity. They start to look a little rough by fall. But if you're looking at something that's going to be productive, and something that provides you and your family with pounds of food, some of these are very, very good choices for that. I think pound for pound, the things that I've encountered that are gonna give you the most harvest, sweet potatoes, calabasa, other vegetables you can get a really good harvest off of, cherry tomatoes in either the spring or the fall, I always end up with buckets of them when they really start producing well. Those are things that you're going to be successful with. Other things, heirloom tomatoes, cucumbers, uh, traditional summer squash, yellow squash and zucchini, things like that. They're tougher and you can grow them and you can get a harvest off of them, but you're probably not going to get just as many pounds of food for the effort off of them as what you might with some of these other summertime choices. So if anybody has any last minute questions, you can go ahead and put them in the chat box. Other than that, thank you so much. Let me go ahead and turn off the recording here.